Okay. Welcome to the City Council meeting of March 7th. I'm going to go ahead and start the meeting. Roll call, please. Oh, Pledge of Allegiance first. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do not forget the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, roll call, please. Please note for the record that all council members are present. City manager, please report out from closed session. Uh, yes, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, Councils uh, or the Brisbane Housing Authority met in closed session tonight and um, provided direction to the real property negotiator, negotiator with regards to a um, land sale. Um, the Brisbane City Council also met in closed session on um, four items. Um, provided uh, direction to the real property negotiator with regards to a potential lease of property. Um, and provided direction uh, with regards to a right-of-way issue with the development agreement that will come back to you at uh, a future city council meeting. Um, they met with regards to um, anticipated litigation and gave direction not to pursue that and with regards to a liability claim and um, provided direction with regards to that also. Great, thank you. That brings us to the adoption of the agenda. Didn't, didn't we move to um, deny the one item? The claim? Yes. Yes, we, uh, the council gave direction to deny the claim, yes. Thank you. Okay, that brings... Move adoption of the agenda. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That brings us to oral communications number one. Is there a member of the public who would wish to address the council on any items not on the agenda? Seeing no hands. Move on to presentation. Flood and sea level rise resiliency agency. Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, I am uh, Larry Patterson. I'm here on behalf of CCAG and the Board of Supervisors to present to you the proposal for a flood and sea level rise resiliency agency. Um, we're hoping that that term rolls right off your tongue in the future. <laughs> the acronym isn't any, any good, so we have to, we're work, working on that. But I, I think tonight I, I want to make sure that you get the information that you need uh, to take the action that's being requested. Ultimately, we are asking each city within the county to uh, endorse the proposal and provide some, uh, we hope, reasonable uh, funding level to get the agency startup completed. So tonight, I'm going to talk about that agency, why it's needed, uh, talk about some of the key aspects of the proposal itself uh, and the process that uh, led up to its development. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the schedule for the startup and kind of what would be done during the startup phase. Uh, and then talk about the funding a little bit uh, and give you a summary of kind of who's uh, endorsed um, the proposal to date and kind of who are who have some pending endorsements uh, over the next week or two. So um, I'll come to the action requested, which I've kind of led in with, which is the, to uh, ask you to adopt a resolution that would endorse the proposal for the Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency Agency and, um, and provide some initial funding for its startup. Um, why it's needed, uh, this process has really been ongoing since 2013. There was a water summit, there have been a number of meetings, there have been discussions at CCAG, discussions at the county about exactly how to address the sea level rise as a priority, and, uh, and recognizing that the potential impacts in San Mateo are uh, extremely significant. Um, so when you talk about it having a significant impact, then the mitigation is actually very complex at times. It can be um, very expensive, and often it takes more than one agency to really solve the issue. So we've been at a disadvantage in the county uh, when pursuing funding for projects because each individual city has been pursuing funding on their own. And from a federal or a state level, that's not a very efficient way to do it and we're not very as successful as we could be otherwise. Now recently, and uh, Erica uh, Powell is with me tonight, 
she's been working on some MOU, MOU projects where cities have come together to actually pursue specific improvements, and the grant funding has been much more accessible, even at that level. So what we're talking about is taking the existing flood control district that exists within the county. Um, it was actually formed in 1958, and modernizing it and changing its scope as well as its governance <coughs> so that it uh, provides more involvement from cities. Uh, we, we also see, and we just had a letter that arrived today from the Regional Water Quality Control Board, one of the things on the horizon for local agencies is regional stormwater facilities, uh, primarily things uh, through the permit and the work that's being done by CCAG. But the, but the shift is going to be less from just the permit and administrative and monitoring to really major capital improvements. One of the advantages of this proposed uh, agency is that it, it appears through the letter we got from the regional board that the benefit from having a regional facility anywhere in the county could be realized, the benefits could be realized from a permitting perspective for all of the communities within uh, the county. So it's not insignificant at all. That's a huge uh, opportunity. And with that then, when, as we're building these facilities, no one agency is really very well equipped to uh, maintain these facilities that would be constructed. So uh, that's another area where this proposed agency could be of significant benefit. The process, uh, I think one of the major milestones was the formation by CCAG of a standing committee. That standing committee established a staff advisory team uh, that, that then went to work working with ESA as the consultant to develop a proposal, and that's kind of eventually what has arrived in front of you tonight. Um, we had multiple outreach meetings, one of them was here, um, and we had input from staff and some elected officials about what was being proposed and what the concerns were in some cases. Uh, for example, one thing that shaped kind of the direction was that there was a little bit of concern about retaining this issue solely within the Board of Supervisors. There was a need for the local involvement mm -hmm. at the city level. Uh, so we worked through that proposal, took it to both the CCAG Board and to the Board of Supervisors, both of whom endorsed it uh, uh, enthusiastically, and that kind of began the process that we're in tonight, which is going out to the individual cities and asking for your support. There are two documents that are uh, created. One is the proposal, uh, and one is uh, kind of an executive summary of that proposal, and those are really the basis upon which the recommendation has been constructed. Um, it includes, as I said, modifying the existing flood control district to include a seven-member board. That board would be comprised of two from the Board of Supervisors, one of which would be District 3, which is the coast side, and five members from cities, uh, north, central, south, and coast, uh, plus one at-large position. Uh, the recommendation is that, that those uh, positions be uh, established by CCAG. And so CCAG has been working on setting the boundaries for what the, what the north, south, central, uh, and those boundaries would be. Uh, we've talked about a three-year startup. That's aggressive. Um, the intent here during the startup, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is to kind of move this agency forward to a, a place where it is sustainable. Um, to get us to that point, there's a sharing of the funding, half by the county, half by uh, cities. So that's what's being asked of you is the, the city portion. Uh, in that startup period, probably a central part of what would be done would be developing an investment plan. That doesn't exist today. So the idea is to be able to describe kind of the, the projects and the programs and the approach that would be taken uh, to uh, invest in uh, sea level rise and flooding improvements within the county. Um, to do that, you need an ongoing funding source. Um, so that's the, the startup process. And, and I don't think you can get a funding source if you can't explain to people how the funds would be used. And so these two go hand in hand. Uh, there are two things that are ongoing in the county that would not be disrupted. One is the MOU projects. Uh, Eric Kapow can discuss those more if you have questions. Um, but basically, these were MOUs literally between multiple agencies to uh, pursue a specific uh, flooding issue together and, and uh, pursue grant funding together. And those have been very successful. Those would not be interrupted. Those MOUs would remain in place. The cities that are in those MOUs would continue to direct kind of where they're headed and how they proceed. Uh, the other part is the flood control district, which would not be disrupted. <clears throat> Some, uh, to get the flood control district 
uh, modified requires state legislation. So you will see a bill sponsored by uh, Assemblyman uh, Mullen, uh, AB 825, that is actually aimed at changing this um, district that was formed in 1958, modernizing <laughs> it and changing the governance as we've talked about. But in addition, there are some things that, um, that the flood control district currently does that we don't want to disrupt either. Part of it is the projects, uh, heavily, uh, I think, oriented around Coma Creek, but, but basically you, we want that work to continue. Um, the process has been, as I mentioned, getting the proposal together, getting endorsement by both the Board of Supervisors and the CCAG Board, and then moving into this process, which is the darker blue part of the arrow on, on the screen. Um, and that the idea is that we would complete that um, prior to the start of the next fiscal year, so the funding would be part of your next budget. And this table um, summarizes, and I, I won't go through each cell of the table, but if you look at the startup, which is really where the cities are helping to fund the work, um, they would produce about a, a $1.1 million, $1 million in revenue. Um, of that, 750000 would come from the cities and the other three hundred and fifty from the county. And that doesn't sound like a 50-50 split. So you have to look at the next row, which talks about the MOU services, MOU services which are funded by the county already. And to maintain those, they're contributing $400,000 there to maintain those uh, MOU projects and their progress. The two things I mentioned about the flood control district that are a bit unique, one is um, if you see in the, the cell with the dollars in it, uh, there is about $3.8 million that's collected uh, in, within that flood control district and can be spent only within three subzones. Uh, but those are pre-prop $13, not something that we want to disrupt in the process we're talking about in terms of modifying the flood control district. But that's important to maintain that funding and then build on it with what the new agency would do. The second half is the CCAG through the flood control district collects a million and a half a year. Uh, to fund the permit and the administrative part of the process. So, again, that's something that needs to continue on, uh, and uh, those would not be disrupted as part of the funding. So we end up with the cities and the county combining to keep the MOU process going, keeping the flood district uh, projects going, and starting up this new agency uh, and expanding its role countywide and uh, with the role of addressing sea level rise. This is out of the proposal and out of the, the, um, the executive summary, but it's just a graphical kind of summary of the same thing. You can see where your city fits within the three funding tiers. Um, it was done in bands rather than individual by population with different amounts for every city. Uh, the attempt was to try to make sure that we kept the dollars as reasonable as possible, given we needed enough to make the startup successful. Uh, the biggest part of the startup cost probably being in the investment plan. Uh, a little bit about where we are in the endorsement, endorsement process. As I mentioned, uh, CCAG board uh, uh, endorsed it first. They had their meeting on January 10th, and that was followed by January 29th with the Board of Supervisors. Both were unanimous. Um, and then we began the process with the cities. And I'm going to expand a little bit about the endorsements today because this probably understates where we are today. But Belmont and South San Francisco, East Palo Alto, and Half Moon Bay have all formally endorsed uh, this proposal. We have other cities that include Menlo Park, um, Coma, uh, I'll think of others, that actually had study sessions or informational items that they wanted to discuss first, you're kind of doing that in the same night. There are others that have kind of split them between two different evenings. So we have others where their decision is pending, having already made the presentation and answered questions that might have come up. So we're working towards probably within the next couple of weeks having something close to half of the cities endorsing the process and the, and the proposal. This other thing is that we're starting to get some real support from elsewhere. I mentioned the, the board, uh, the Regional Water Quality Control Board uh, and their letter, which really is significant for us um, and their support for what we're doing. Um, we have a letter from Jackie Spear and her support. She's been very supportive of moving us in this direction uh, since the beginning of the discussions back <coughs> in 2013. And, um, and then we, we have had uh, support expressed and will be coming in writing from folks like the Save, Our, Save the Bay 
uh, and uh, I, we're meeting next week with the uh, Peninsula Regional Open Space District, all of whom are interested in supporting this. We're looking at things outside of just the cities. Uh, we've just now scheduled a meeting with uh, the airport, SFO, to talk about kind of what their role and participation might be within this process because they are right up against our cities. <coughs> you can't fix one problem without having to fix the other to really uh, have a solution. So we'll be talking to them. We'll see down the road talking to major employers about how they might participate. But to start with, we have to get enough uh, funding to really get that startup process moving forward and enough definition about what we intend to do through the investment plan to be able to communicate that with the public. So that's where we are today. The rest of the meetings, I, I, when I made this uh, slide, all the other meetings are going to be completed by April 8th. I just got a change from Atherton, and they're going on April 17th. So um, April, April mid-April. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we'll be done with at least uh, approaching every city for their support uh, by mid-April. Um, two things we're just asking for is an endorsement of this proposal to allow it to move forward and within your budgeting process allocating enough funding for your share of the startup costs over the three-year period mm -hmm. if you have any questions be happy to answer I, I don't have any questions I, I just have a comment thank you Larry for that uh, I think uh, it certainly is an <coughs> important you know I mean sea level rise is you know global climate change is real I mean there's people still in this country who choose not to believe it but uh, I know most people in Bay Area at least you know I think it's real and I think this is an important endeavor so thank you for your presentation yeah I think one of the things the challenges we have is that that every time there's an estimate of what the sea level rise is really going to be it increases because the ice melt is increasing as well mm -hmm. so so uh, and then if you combine that with just how complicated and expensive these projects can be you realize that uh, and they take decades to implement so if you think, well, we're not going to have to worry until 2050, and we're already, say, 2020, we have barely enough time to get some of those projects mm -hmm. in place. So uh, there's some urgency, even though it doesn't show up on the calendar. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, thank you for the presentation, Larry. And uh, also just thank you for not retiring and going playing golf. You know, that you're, you, you know, golf, right? well, yeah, no, you can't, but just, you know, I, oh, no. you know, this is a serious issue, no, I right? I mean, it's the, you know, uh, climate change is the, the biggest issue facing humanity ever. And so um, we need good people on board to, you know, deal with it. And so, um, you know, a couple of years ago, I'm blanking out on the, the, the ballot measure. It was the nine county uh, property tax one. Uh, is that AA you're talking about for the, the, the Bay Area? E, the yeah, area? yeah. So um, how, how would those funds be utilized in, in what you're trying to accomplish? Well, the way we look at it is regardless of where the funding source is, you have to have some single voice so that you can actually approach them and have a successful grant application. And, and that's kind of what we're doing with this agency. Um, what I've seen so far, and Erica may have more information than I do, but there isn't a lot of definition about how you're going to be able to qualify for the, the, the funds, although it is a lot of, uh, I think, marshland restoration and things that are supportive of what we're doing uh, that may be uh, supplemental or even uh, reduce the amount of work that we have to do. But at this point, I don't have enough information about how that's going to work. All we know is that we really can't be competitive if we, if we don't get our act together. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, thank you. Okay. And by the way, I didn't mean to be flippant about the golf, but the, but the reality was uh, when I was asked to participate in this, um, I couldn't think of an issue that I would rather spend some time uh, working on because of its significance. So I agree with you 100%. All right. I have no question. So I just <clears throat> wanted to say that um, when I was on CCAG, I was on the beginning of the wa All Things Water yes. um, Committee, and it's good to see that... <coughs> Work that they've done has finally come to um, a group and a, <coughs> a mythology to get it done. I am wondering why the funding is so disproportionate based on population um, for cities. Um, excuse me. Based on the size of the cities, 
<coughs> there's a cost to per public per person between 50 cents for some cities clear up over five dollars per person in others <coughs> so i'm just wondering how they did the rationale on that <coughs> Uh, there was a lot of discussion around the funding, and um, and uh, I, I said this at uh, one of the other council meetings, is that I don't think population will be used again in terms of funding the improvements we're talking about within this flood and sea level rise resiliency agency. This was a one-time effort because the startup isn't directly related to a specific part of the county or a specific uh, population within the county. It's really just trying to get the organization up and running and defining what we need to do. Then the, I think the funding would move to a, a different rationale in terms of the benefits, for example, that, that would be received and trying to relate that to how much people would pay. This startup, though, needed to be by some measure, and we talked about a lot of different options, arrived at population. Uh, looked at population specifically by the number of people, so it was different for every agency. Uh, and then really tried to keep the dollar amounts low enough that that started not to make as much sense anymore. If you do the math as you did, obviously the numbers are quite different. But in terms of looking at an annual budget amount for a jurisdiction, we felt that these amounts were something that folks could accommodate and that uh, it made it simpler and clearer in terms of defining what we're going to do for this three-year period. So uh, is it an ideal measure where the benefits would be achieved? It is not. It wasn't expected to be that. Uh, is it a way of differentiating between larger communities and smaller communities? It is. Uh, whether it goes far enough that direction, that's something for, for you all you to, to try to gauge. So this, this proposed, because it says proposed annual funding um, per city. Yes. <clears throat> and while the county is the largest funder, all of our city tax all our taxes go into the county also so it's sort of that you're paying it on the county level and you're paying it at the city level and and i think that the cost is small enough that for our city budget it it probably will work <coughs> but it does seem a little bit unfair that um some cities are paying 12 dollars per person and it's is a regional no. thing where even though Highway 101 runs along Bayshore, you know, along Brisbane's waterfront, it's not just a Brisbane problem. So, just comment. I, I understand. Any other comments? <laughs> okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you for your presentation. Thank you. Now moving on to the consent calendar, I had a request from a member of the public to pull item B. <laughs> Item what? B. Okay, I want to take right. item C. Staff report, okay. And uh, I'll make a motion to approve items A, D, E, and F. Do you have a second? Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Can staff give a um, overview on item B, please? Uh, yes, Honorable Mayor, members of the council. Every year the city is obligated to report uh, to the state on our progress of the city's progress in meeting our various housing um, objectives and that relates to the production of housing per year and so what you have in front of you is a table a series of tables that are in a format that the state requires us to provide this information in um, and I think in this year we approved planning permits for 12 market rate units and four moderate units and building permits were issued for one market rate unit and five moderate income units um, there's also a table that shows progress in implementing various policies that were set forth in the um, housing element and i'm glad to discuss those further if that's the council's uh, desire that i'd entertain any questions you have any questions about this item no i have, no I just, uh, I have a quick question um, <coughs> Uh, Madam Mayor. So, hey, John, um, you know, it seems like there's been a lot of uh, ADUs being built in Brisbane, which I think is great. Um, but those wouldn't be considered uh, low income. Those are those are all moderate. Those are considered moderate. Huh? Yeah, oh. we uh, to do that, we had to um, do a survey of units uh, that were rented and to all 
permits that were issued and trying to get some reporting back on how they're being treated and rented so HCD would give us credit at all. Uh, so that was part of what we came up with, moderate being kind of the range of, of rental price based on surveys we've done over the last few years. Okay, great, thanks. Anybody else? Okay. Motion to um, approve item B. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Yeah, item C, which is uh, resolution 29, 2019-03, uh, which is endorsing the San Mateo County uh, Flood and Sea Level Rise Resiliency Agency. And I uh, uh, just want to pull that off to acknowledge that I think this is important, and uh, I'd like to make a motion to uh, propose that we accept and approve resolution 2019-03 for $25,000 a year for the next three years. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. That brings us Thank you, Larry. to old business. Uh, Madam I'd, Mayor, oh. um, could I suggest, uh, I think we you have some people in the audience on um, old business B um, and um, or perhaps old business B, but certainly um, new business A and um, it's only staffs involved in the priority-based budgeting, so maybe you want to handle those first, and sure. we'll do priority-based budgeting last. Okay, so are you suggesting new business A first? Uh, new business, uh, um, new business A and B, yeah. A and B. Okay. So moving on to new business item A: approval of public art request for proposal for the skateboard park, and directing staff to solicit up to two additional members of the community to be on the selection <laughs> committee. Staff report, please. Yes. The public art uh, committee has started their process of trying to find places to put public art. The first place that they are thinking would be a, would work would be the skateboard park. And as I showed you, it would be on the uh, wall of the quarter pipe that faces Old County Road. And then also potentially on the green space in front of that if it works from a traffic perspective as well. The amount of money that they would like to put towards this is $25,000. The the fund has an excess of $600,000 available in it, so the $25,000 fits well within the amount of money available. The we have attached a, I've attached a request for proposal with this to we are the committee is looking for all ideas. They're not really limited to any idea of what public art might be. There's been conversation about having a, potentially a mural, having some maybe small sculptures in the in the right-of-way area if that works, uh, doing a mosaic if that works. So they're really looking for a wide variety of ideas. There's nothing that is limiting them on that. The There is an understanding that not all of the artists may have worked with the with public entities before who do this kind of work. So they would be willing to have somebody who hasn't had public uh, work with governments before to be part of this process. The other item, the other item on the um, pr request for proposal is the timeline. At the very beginning, I put a deadline of May, 20, May 17th, but I actually meant it to say May 24th because what the anticipation would be is that we would get the proposals on May 24th we would then shortlist the artists uh, by June 14th, so there would be a meeting of the set selection committee in between the May 24th and June 14th. We would then interview the shortlisted uh, artists, you know, hopefully the week of June 24th. We would then go to the July 10th Parks and Recreation Commission for them to uh, see the recommended artist and then come to the city council meeting for the July 18th meeting for the selection of the artists themselves. So hopefully we're going to get this all done before the end of December is what we're anticipating. So this will be another project that we will have done this year along with the one in the library. So we're moving forward with our public art. Uh, the committee also recommends that we have another two members of the community sit on the selection committee. The committee talked about what types of members there would be, and they had requested that the city solicit members who are skateboarders, who are in that area, but not necessarily require that they be skateboarders because this is a piece of art that will be seen by the entire community. 
So what the staff will do is do in in addition to the general advertising for so, uh, members of this, we will also post at the skateboard park, and we will also work with our yak to encourage to allow people to who are younger to be encouraged to do this because some of the challenges when you're younger you don't always feel as invited when you see something on this on the signboard uh, so we will do that as well um, the re the hope would be is that we would have the selection committee chosen prior to the may 24th deadline but that we're not anticipating having the committee meet until after that may 24th so if somebody <laughs> may not be here available um, prior to May 24th, but can be interviewed, but be back in town by June 4th, you know, by sometime in that June 14th time frame, that would work as well, because maybe some of the people who might be interested may be away at college at this point who might be, you might want to interview. I'm thinking that covers everything that we talked about in the Public Art Committee. I'll look to Madison and Karen to see if I left anything out on this. No, I think you've got it. Okay, council question. <clears throat> I have none. Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, public comment. I do have one slip here regarding this item for Michael Barnes. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Michael Barnes. I'm a Brisbane resident. Um, this priority based budgeting process is very. Oh, I'm sorry. We changed the agenda. Thank you very much for changing the agenda for me so I don't have to sit through that. Hey! Um, <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very happy that there is a public art program in Spain, and I'm excited that the first completed public art project may be the skate park. It may be the library. We'll see. But um, I, think, I think it's all great. I'm here this evening to stress the, the skate park aspect of the public art project out there at the skate park. Um, the, the most powerful public art is site-specific art, which refers to the use and history and culture of the site. We have an example in Brisbane of this site-specific public art that successfully married the use, the history, of site of the art with the art itself. <coughs> and I, if I could play just a, a short video and before I continue, if that's all right. The political instinct to suppress public art is in proportion to the power of the art. La there we go. Great. Are you planning in to play the full video? I gave my son Are you planning to play the full video? The backside of the skate park half pipe. Malcolm immediately decided to use this picture of himself doing an ollie in place of the A in Brisbane. One warm August night, we went out Old County Road and painted this without permission, which made this graffiti, but more important, we did not get caught. This is effective public art. Public art is an artist's self-expression meant to attract attention, be experienced, and at its best, be memorable. Experience of public art should change the mental or physical environment and may be educational, enjoyable, celebratory, transformative, and enhancement or demarcate a location. Other skaters like the stencil art that transformed the skate park so much that they wanted their images painted. We worked with Josh Bunker here doing a finger whip and Kieran Roberts to produce this stencil. Public art reflects community values, yet may also question assumptions. Good public art enriches the community by evoking meaning in the public forum, raising awareness, inspiring or providing perspective. About this time, the Park and Rec Commission held hearings to prioritize capital improvement projects, including a new skate park. The skate park showed skaters like Morgan Lee that they could make enjoyable mental and physical changes to their skate park. The skater art also marked the skate park as their location, made others aware of them, inspired the skaters to make, and inspired the skaters to make the short walk to City Hall and represent themselves at city meetings. Integrated site-based public art like this incorporates location history, culture, and social circumstance. Morgan's painting refers to the site use and graffiti culture of skating. Oh, she's going behind. The result of different experiences of public art may lead to community dialogue with the possibility that the art gives the community identity. 
Brisbane identified with the skate park graffiti so deeply that we sold 600 t-shirt reproductions of the original Brisbane graffiti. But as you know, not all art appeals to all people. To invite the wider community of Brisbane to appreciate the skate park, we painted Douglas Iris, California Poppies, and Lupin. I can't tell you in the skaters' words what they thought of this, but they tolerated the flowers. <laughs> The skaters had learned how public art influences the public conversation. Graffiti speaks to skaters, like Alex York, here doing a bride flip. Shepard Ferry, who you know as the Obama Hope artist, was a skater whose art grew out of his skateboarding culture. Ferry and Banksy are both artists of merit who work in spray paint and stencils in public places. Stencil spray paintings of Brisbane skaters like Anthony show the public, allow the public to experience skate culture through the materials and methods of that culture. The skaters' art celebrated their culture and was memorable. Their art raised an awareness for our children and provided us a new perspective on the skate park. Art on the skate park should be comfortable to skaters and reflect who they are. Their art is graffiti, so this is appropriate art on the Brisbane Skate Park. Art powerfully connected the skaters and inspired them to advocate at city council meetings for this new skate park. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, the political instinct to suppress public art. So, just to, to recap the, uh, the site specific nature of the skate park, kind of means that we should include skaters, at, as staff has suggested and the committee is recommending that we reach out to skaters, and I think that's great. I hope we really make a, a good effort of that, because having a couple of skaters on the committee, they're only going to, at most, account for 20% of the members in the committee, and the, the rest of the community is already extremely well represented in the seven-member community, a uh, seven-member committee, none of whom skate. So um, I just hope that we, we keep the skaters in mind and the, the use and history of that skate park in mind as we go forward with this process. Um, and in conclusion, um, the idea that the, the skate park is visible from the community park is true, but also the, the public art is a way of showing the people in the community park who the skaters are, what the culture is, who our kids are, which is what the previous skate park public art did. Um, and that I hope we, we keep the skaters in mind when we approve the art so that the community understands the skaters instead of that that canvas being used as a mirror for the people in the community park to see themselves. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Any other public comments? No? Okay, moving on to council discussion. Motion to approve public art proposal for skate park and uh, direct staff to solicit Two, two additional members? Or is it? Yeah. Yes. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now moving on to new business item B. Consider approval of the reimbursement agreement with HCP, LS Brisbane, LLC. Um, this is continued from the City Council meeting of February 21st, 2019. Staff report, please. Yes, ma'am. Honorable Mayor, Mayor Tim, Council members, good evening. I understand you did discuss this a little bit uh, back in February. I unfortunately was not able to be here. I was at a League of Cities Board of Directors meeting. Uh, essentially what has happened here is there is a development going on on South Shoreline out at Sierra Point, and because of the recentness of it, as we attempted to obtain a waiver from the Division of Drinking Water, we discovered that that department suddenly has a, a huge interest in what's going on and what the technical details are of the water lines. So this developer ended up spending several hundred thousand dollars to get us to the point where we almost have full approval today. Uh, we, we hope to get it later this month. And so the purpose of this agreement is to, to set in place, and it's an agreement only with that development, but it tells them that if another property out there develops, and if they are able to use the geotechnical and the civil engineering work, that the city will obtain a fair share reimbursement back to this original developer who did the work. And that may not have been clear uh, in the agreement when it was first written, but if you notice in, the, in this staff report, paragraph three on the therefores, more specifically calls that out. So what it says this time is that 
if that benefiting property can use and elects to use that, then they pay the share. And that's always been the intent of it, but that's how we moved it along. So, uh, and I think we, one of the things we did not do in there, there was one party out there that we really uh, didn't have any permit applications for. We didn't think they were very far along, and we did not identify them by name. That party is identified by name in the staff report. So now you understand that there are two properties out there. There's the one in the northwest corner, which now has an address. That's 3000 Marina Boulevard. And then there's that large parcel of undeveloped land kind of on the eastern side uh, of the property. It's, it's just west of the parking lot that the boaters use. And it's, it's an area that before was fenced off, was very popular with uh, four by four uh, off-road vehicles. And I think now it's mostly used by remote control airplane enthusiasts. But so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions from you. Council questions? I don't have any questions on I, I just have one. No. Um, thank you for clarifying it because we didn't discuss it because you weren't here to answer some of those questions for us. Um, and one of my questions to you is that if the city of Brisbane is a beneficiary of this work for water they need to bring in for whether it be for a park or other things, are we sub we're not subject to this agreement or would we be able to use that information we're we not we're not uh benefiting property but we are the owner and the operator of the water lines and we actually are the permittee we are actually the person who obtained the waiver so we would be able to use this back this information we would be yes ma'am we would be able to use this information yes, okay great thank you any other questions motion to approve um Reimbursement agreement with HCP LS and Brisbane LLC. Second. Do do we need to open it? Did I already ask for public comment? Is there any anyone from the public? Okay. All right. <coughs> Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Now we're moving back up to old business. Item A: Priority based budgeting update from the finance department. Yeah, it's Madam Mayor, I, I think, are you here for the uh, volleyball court? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, great. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're so entertaining, aren't we? <laughs> Thanks for being here. You must be bored. <laughs> no, he knew. No, this we is what we want civic engagement. <laughs> he knew we were going to do priority based budgeting tonight, and he said, what better I'm place so could be? I'm so excited. I just have to come down and watch that. Can I also acknowledge that he's actually delivered, he dropped off a donation for LunaFest. One of, this is one of our platinum donors here, so super thankful that not only did he drop off a great donation, but now he gets to have a thrilling council oh, meeting. Oh, we have to ask the cameras to swing around to view the audience so people don't do it. <laughs> okay, our mystery man. Okay. Let's do it. Yes, okay. so... When we went through the budget process back uh, last June, we talked. I talked about bringing back each of the individual departments to talk about purpose for the programs. So this is the first of them. I figured I would use the finance department and the central services because those were mine as the guinea pigs to see how this goes and to be able to start that conversation. So before I start, what I wanted to do is remind the public and everybody else what the community goals and results are. So the city council has adopted five different community goals or results. They are being fiscally prudent, having a safe community, community building, ecological sustainability, and economic development. And those are the definitions for what those were. Uh, just to re bring you up to speed as to where we've been, I, this is a flow chart that I used when we started the priority-based budgeting process. The thing, items in red are the ones that we have completed, and the ones in green are what we are currently working on. Uh, right now, we're going to be reviewing council reviews the purpose for the individual programs, and that's what we're starting at this point in time. So the question is, why is purpose important for what we do? Uh, there's three big reasons. Uh, it promotes strategic thinking, acting, and learning. It improves decision making and it enhances an organizational effectiveness. If we know what the purpose is that we're moving towards, we can actually get it done. If we're unsure of what the purpose is, it's hard to get to your, your destination. A um, couple of examples, 
is when you have an ill an ill defined purpose or you have a purpose that not everybody's in agreement with, you end up what's called the, the road to Abilene. I don't know if everybody has seen this uh, video or this idea, but the basic story of it is way back when on a hot day in Coleman in Texas, it was 104 degrees and this family is sitting around talking and one of them says, the father says, you know, the best lemonade I ever had was when, when was in Abilene. And he says, you know, that might be interesting to go to Abilene. It's 104 degrees and the son says, so have you fixed the air conditioning in the Buick? And the father says, nope, not yet. And they go, hmm. But you know what? The group decides in some fashion to drive to Abilene for lemonade that day. And they get back after four hours of going there, drinking their lemonade. And when they start talking, they realize that no one wanted to go there because they never talked about why, what it was about the lemonade that they wanted or could they have had it someplace else. It was just a conversation that came up and they never really talked about it. And so when you talk about wanting to define your purpose, we want to know why we're doing things that we're doing. And that's why they live in Texas. <laughs> that's why. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, 104 <laughs> degrees, that's kind of hot for me. I thought there but was a joke there. No, I don't know. I mean, th this Mark is... always finds a way. <laughs> but this is the problem, is like when you don't really talk about why you're doing something, sometimes you end up doing things you never wanted to do. Um, also, when you talk about purpose versus method is another thing that we get confused with at times. So, you know, if, you know the conversation would be is like, you know, if we want to end up in Berkeley, there's a lot of different ways to get there. You can take 101 to 80, you can take 101, 92 to 580, you can take 101 to 880 and go all the way around San Jose, or you can go Golden Gate Bridge to 580. Lots of different ways to get to Berkeley. But if you say that, you know, we're gonna take 101 to 80 to get there because that's always the fastest way and there's traffic, you may actually not get there anytime near when you wanted to. So the question is, is do you want to talk about how you're, going to, how you're going to get to someplace, or do you want to talk about where you want to end up? And then you let somebody else to work through that process of making sure we get there efficiently. So that's where, you know, talking about purpose becomes important. Um, if, and if you notice, we're beginning to put the purposes on our staff reports, so that way council can look at the purpose and say, yeah, that is what we're trying to achieve with what we're doing now. So in the finance department, just want to start off with what our mission statement is. The finance, uh, the finance division delivers reliable financial and information technology services. We're responsible for facilitating the planning, organization, implementation, control, coordination, and direction of the financial and technological policies and programs in the city as established by the city council and the city manager. So the first question is, is that really what you as a city council want us to be doing? And so this is going to be one of those conversations where it's really up to the city council to provide feedback back to staff to make sure that we are doing what you want us to do. So um, is this really what the mission of the finance department is in the council's opinion? I'm gonna you looking for an answer? I'm looking for an answer. Oh. <laughs> I am. I mean, this is, this is what we think you want, but... Let me pull just, out the decision tree here. Yeah. <laughs> well, just because we think this is what we want doesn't mean this is necessarily the mission that you have for us. So I want to make sure that before we, you know, we move forward that we're really working towards what you want us to do. Okay, I say yes. Okay. Oh. I'm seeing general acknowledgement. But I, I feel like prudent should be... Okay. ...in here, like... I mean, I guess those ultimately financial decisions are our decisions, but, you know, we hope that we're making prudent decisions, too. Right. So, I mean, that would be the, the purpose for the council to make a decision, prudent. but you, yeah. I mean, you know, are, are, you, do you, would you want the finance department to make the definition of what prudent is that's right. for a city that's right. council? That's right. I mean, that's the question. I mean, and this is yeah. why I'm here tonight, to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what we're doing going forward. I didn't think we were rewriting mission statements tonight. No, we're going to talk about purpose, but I want to make sure that we're going in the right direction at the very I least. I think this is the right direction. Okay. Yeah, you know, well, uh, and just now that you, you brought it up, you know, um, you know, something about communication, like clear communication, I guess. Here, can you pull your mic up? Oh, sorry. Yeah, you know, something about clear communication. Uh, okay. And I know we're going to get that when we start talking about the programs themselves as to what clear communication might mean for the city council when we talk about the accounting and the finance and budgeting. 
and we talk about it there. So maybe that might be a way where, where we can have that conversation as to what the city council means by clear communication. Does that make sense? Um, okay. I mean, I'm just, that might be where we can have it. We can also look at it in here as well, adding something. Okay. Makes sense. All right. Okay. So the finance department does a number of different programs. Uh, we have department management. We do, we provide council support and commission support. We provide citizen engagement. We provide workforce development. We provide accounting, forecasting and budgeting, revenue collection, computer systems, risk management and records management. That's uh, a lot to go through at any given time. So what I was thinking is probably tonight, if we can just focus on three or four of these for the finance department and see how it goes. And if we need to bring back others at a later time. Okay. Okay. So I was thinking the ones that I looked at, which might be, you know, good to talk about was department man, you know, first one was department management, which as I, which our purpose of the staff wrote was coordinate the effective and efficient running of the division. And the reason we do this is to ensure the community that the government funds are being used appropriately and the city's concerns are represented to other government leaders. That's why we think we're doing it. Uh, some questions that I would like to get from council is if you think that that's, that makes sense for department management is, you know, if so, what does the appropriate use of government funds mean? Does it mean that we're staying within budget or does it mean we're accomplishing the task that the city council has asked us to do? I mean, that becomes one of those questions where sometimes there are things that you ask us to do as part of the budget that end up costing more than what we thought it was going to cost. So do we stop in the middle of the project and come back for a budget re uh, approval or do we wait until after we, you know, we can come back at a time of the mid-year budget review, which is sometimes what we end up doing when we think that a individual item in our budget has gone over, but we still have money within the overall budget for that. So that's part of the, that's one of the questions is, you know, what is council looking for when you're asking finance department to state, you know, to use the funds of credently? Is it using it to accomplish what you want us to do? Or is it every single time that we're thinking we're coming over budget that we stop what we're doing and we come forward? Are you asking that now? I am. Okay. So I, if I may, I mean, uh, for me, it, you know, it depends on the significance of mm -hmm. being over budget. You know, I'm not going to, I don't think the council is here to micromanage, but I think if it's uh, significant, uh, I think it's appropriate to um, bring it to the council. That's just yeah, I, I agree with that. It depends on what it is, you know. Um, if it's a, a project, you know, we kind of know there's going to be some fluidity to it, you know, that, you know, you can update us, you know, through city manager's report or, you know, email or something like that. But, you know, if it's, you know, goes into something that's really like an eyebrow raising number you know and kind of know where that is is uh what what is it uh what's the term real money you know that uh, uh we probably should Kay. take a look at it well then i would say how do you determine that what is real money are we saying anything under a hundred thousand dollars i think <laughs> i would say more than that i mean i mean less than that i would you know, for example, school study, right? So I think it depends on the relative, like how relative to what that item was supposed to cost initially. So it went from like almost double budget, right, in that case. So that was, that's I think a perfect example of when something is maybe more than 15 or 20% over budget. <coughs> you know, then that, to me, I think when you look at the scale, um, then it's appropriate to come back is but if if 10 to 15 percent over is maybe only fifteen hundred dollars or something then that that might not be an eye brow raiser but i think it like you know there could be a certain amount like over five thousand over budget and it's 15 to 20 percent more than what we had anticipated i don't know i'm just trying to throw out some or well, like staff maybe right. to come back. Right, but I mean, it may yeah. be something like where you say if it's a small item, if it's like, you know, more, less than 5,000, it's not a big deal. But if it's a bigger item, 15 to 20% might make some sense. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds like really updating the council as opposed to, you know, through a memo might be more appropriate than coming into a complete stop and having to 
wait to <clears throat> move forward is also sounds like what the city council was saying. Well, especially At least what I'm hearing a little bit of from council. So, so what I would say is that the procurement policy that we have in our packet tonight um, really outlines a lot of those things about, you know, what authority different department heads have and when they need to get authority from the council and what projects need that. So I think a lot of it has been, you know, defined in, in that policy. Right, but the city council gives us authority to spend everything in our budget at the beginning of the year. So, you know, when you get to that point, you've given us authority and what may happen is that priorities have, you know, something that we thought was, you know, if we do something at Mission Blue and we think the carpet is going to cost us $5,000 and it ends up costing us $8,000. <coughs> I mean, to me, that's something is like the goal was to get the carpet finished. Or if we're, if the refrigerator ends up costing more or an oven costs more, the goal is to, you know, is it staying, accomplishing that task? Or is it saying, okay, wait a second, we've got to come back. And what I'm hearing is that there is a give and take there. Yeah, And, I, and that's, I think, that's what I'm hearing at this point. I think and there would be different parameters in that too, you know, Stuart, because if there was mobilization costs, like if it was construction of some sort like that, uh, you wouldn't want to have a stop start, you know, right. because you're going to be paying mobilization costs every time, and that's really going to stack up. So, I mean, you have to kind of look at what the parameters are of each okay. specific, specific. Well, and of course, the goal ultimately is to get something done um so you wouldn't so no i and this is why as i said this is the conversation i just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page as where we're moving forward to yeah you know and i think that's that's where it is Stuart. yeah you know, everyone being on the same page right and that's why understanding the purpose and what we're doing and why we're doing it is important so we can be on the same page that's okay. what I'm here for tonight. Um, then the other question is when you start talking about, you know, as I said, as it says here, is that make sure the city concerns are represented to other government leaders. The question, two questions is, what government leaders do we want to interact with? So, uh, you know, the obvious ones are, you know, you want to work with the county, you want to work with the state. Uh, to some extent, we work with the federal government. Um, you know, Randy will talk about, you know, can talk about that a lot. And so what he has to do with the federal government or the state government. But we also, you know, staff spends a lot of time working in with the League of California Cities because that seems to be something that we th want to be represented in. We work with our professional organizations. And, you know, we've always had a very good, you know, as a city, I think we are overrepresented based on our size our size for those things and you know the part of the question tonight is is that what the city council wants us to be doing or do they want us to focus on other things so that's the first question when we say you know what government leaders do we want to interact with is are you comfortable with who we interact with at this point or are you is there some concerns there um <clears throat> i kind of trust that you know who you want to talk to okay no okay I'm, just... no, I'm not a finance person i don't know who you have to talk to and i for the most part, think our stuff does a great job. So, you know, who Lisa needs to talk to to get her job done right. And okay. I, I, yeah, I think it's goal. important to, you know, have that communication, especially, you know, at the uh, county and state level, you know, to <laughs> see what the mindset is. Mm. Usually we find out, you know, like, uh, oh, gee, they just submitted 200 housing bills. Right. You know, through the Chronicle. I mean, you know, it's good to kind of know where the direction our legislature's heading and our county and everything like that. So I think it's really important for staff to to continually have communication you know, on all levels, you know, from law enforcement, fire, public works, you know, and finance, everything. And, and that gets to the next question, which is for what purpose? And it seems to be able to keep the public and the city council informed of what's going on at other other levels of government yeah. and that seems to be what, what the what the purpose is that the city council from what i'm hearing from you clark is talking about is why we do that right. so you know and it's one of those things is you know it takes time away from other things that that staff does but it for if it's important for the council and it's important for the community then it's then it's worthwhile mm -hmm. other communities would tell would say that it's not worthwhile for them to do that and that's mm -hmm. why i'm checking in is making sure that this is what the purpose is and and you may have that strange look, but you know I go to. I do. Well, you did. You have a look at me like really. There are cities that don't do it, but I go to meetings and I never see anybody 
from cities like Colma. I don't see very much many people from East Palo Alto because for them, those kinds of meetings are not, imp are not as important as other things that they want their staff to do. Well, how much more do you get when you collaborate with other people within your realm? I, I, we think, you know, as a city, I think in the past we thought it was important, and that's why we do it. And I'm just, again, checking in, making sure that that's, you know, that's what we're here for. Yeah, we're, we're really, it's been important in the past, Karen, is, is uh, one is, is a lot of the bills that come out, but, yep. but also we've been able to attain uh, a lot of grants on federal level and some state level grants, you know, for fire. But by reaching out and right. yeah, well, yeah, yeah, and collaborating with people yeah, and absolutely. forming relationships and yeah, and you know, and you have Randy who's been on the League of California Cities board, yeah. you know, and that takes time away from other things that he's doing. But if it's important for this community, yeah, and that's Alaska. right, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm saying, you know, we just want to check in. This is what this this is what priority based budgeting is about: is making sure we're meeting the purposes that the city council and the community wants us to meet. I will say so far there hasn't been an instance that's come up where I've said I really don't want staff do I mean doing that okay. I think that you know I think it's like a case-by-case -case thing if there's ever a time that like there's a concern then we address it at that point but I can't see like there being an issue with us being well represented in as many places as possible by um, our staff or by our council yeah. and you know if that ever changes then we'll talk about it, right? I think. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, I, I think that uh, you guys going to conferences, um, getting, uh, you know, learning about best practices and bringing them, you know, back to Brisbane is is very important, and I think, um, you know, it keeps uh, our city current on on um, providing the best services, you know, to our community. I mean, I could see though, you know, in some cities where. Uh, staff could uh, kind of take advantage and you know go on conferences and in uh, events that you know they go a little bit there but there's other issues I mean other things you know personal things that they do and I've never you know in the eight year or ten years I've been on the council it's you know you guys have always done a professional uh, job in regards to uh, interacting with uh, with others and, and, and you know, and we think we do as well. And I will say, there's other cities that don't and don't go to conferences. Mm. Yeah, I think we're a relatively innovative city in in a number of ways, and I think that that is because staff is empowered to go out and learn what the best of the best is doing, and bring those ideas back to Brisbane. And I think our council is empowered that way, and our commissions and committees too. So. Um, so it seems like we're right on purpose for what we're doing. With yeah, I know, for sure. And, you know, if you're ever not on purpose, we'll let you know. You know, and I think um, any time that you, you, you know, like know. maybe that you do go to one of those events, you know, m maybe perhaps just kind of sharing, you know, uh, yeah, we did this thing and we learned this. X, Y, and Z. And, um, yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, and that, you know. Again, that, that's sense. like, you know, lines of communication. It's you know, It's strength. all within reason, you know, reasonable amounts of, you know, we don't want staff out gallivanting to every conference. I think that as long as staff is doing it prudently and going to where they feel they get the best bang for their buck and their time, that we're very supportive of that. Okay. But it's all within reason, and it really depends where we're at in our budget and our finances, which is, again, why we call it priority-based. Right, and that's exactly what we're looking at. So that brings us to the workforce development, and I think you've, we've already probably answered all these questions about why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. So I'll skip this one. Um, for accounting, uh, record you know, our, our purpose is to record, maintain, and report on the city's financial transactions according to the requirements of state and national standards. That's, why, that's what we do. And we do this is to ensure the city's funds are safe and financial information is presented in an understandable manner. And I think this gets to your question. Mm -hmm. Cliff, is what does that really mean? You know, the question is, is it understandable to who? Um, you know, is it understandable for the city council? Is it understandable to the financial community, which is a very different kind of information that we provide? Is it, infor is it um, understandable to the general public? Um, are we trying to provide information to everybody? Or are we, you know, and how does that look? You know, we spend a lot of, I think we spend a lot of time focusing on the financial community when we do our CAFR. 
when we do our budget and we do, you know, we come back to the city council and we explain what's going on with the CAFR. We talk about the budget, but does the general public have that same knowledge that and that other pe that the council does or somebody who looks at it who has got a more professional or should we as a city be spending more time trying to translate what we're doing into a more general public perspective? As you can tell by how many people attend our <laughs> budget meetings and discussions. We have one brave soul in the audience tonight um, for this part of the meeting. I think that the information that I've seen available through the city for anyone who is interested and wants to know more is certainly plenty and it's more than 99.999% of our public wants to know. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, our former colleague Ray Miller always says, it, you know, the, he always thinks that uh, doing the budget is the most important thing you know, of the city, which, you know, in a sense it is. I mean, it's, it sets up the whole operating thing and, uh, um, you know, sets up the stage. It sets up the priorities for the upcoming right. year or two. And, and, but nobody shows up. And we couldn't get them here if we fed them. Yeah, so even if you dumbed it down or whatever you want to call it, uh, the people still wouldn't show okay. up. Okay. So I'm... Hmm. Well, that's good to know. Um, as, so long as, as long as, you know, Rome's not burning... Well, I think that's that, that's what that's where it is, Clark. Right? I mean, uh, people really, you know, if you're if you're doing a good job and everything s seems to be, you know, by the book and it's very transparent, people are good with that. They only get you know involved when there's a problem, right? And then they then they get up in arms. And I think, um, you know, the way that we've conducted the budget. In, in that transparent way over the years is, you know, is the appropriate way to do it. Okay. I mean, how many questions do you get from the general public to your office about something financial that they don't understand, honestly, per week? Uh, per week? I would per say month. maybe four times in the seven, 18 years I've been here. Okay. <laughs> There's Zero your, per week. There's your answer. I, I, okay. I mean, and as I said, this is um, this is what we just want to make sure that we're you doing. You just wanted to make yourself laugh with this. <laughs> I did want to make myself laugh with this. And is there information that council is looking for that we're not providing? That would be the other question. Is there some other information that you're looking for? I, I have something that might be completely irrelevant, but as the, the newest person on the city council, I always worry about money. And are we going to have enough in our rainy day fund for when it rains harder than it has in the last month. And we know that is possible and that is coming and it is gonna come again. Um, I think that's possibly something that might be interesting to the general public to know, you know, what are we doing to save for a rainy day kind mm -hmm. of thing. So maybe having, you know, maybe when we get to the next one as opposed to from an accounting perspective, because <clears throat> when you look at accounting, accounting is what happened and the next one is forecasting and budgeting, and that's what's going to happen. Right. So, you know, I, every two years I come forward when I do the budget and I go through a very long explanation as to our reserves and everything, but it may make some sense to do that maybe more than just every couple of years. Maybe we do that every year, uh, you know, in addition to that. No. Well, okay. I know we've printed in the past, you know, kind of a, a synopsis of that. We do. Yeah, and, and that, I, I think, kind of, so what you're hitting on, Karen, is, you know, it's kind of, you know, and, and, and that's how our uh, um, reserves are set up, mm -hmm. you know, like, you know, the, you know, catastrophe level, you know, to recession yep. level, you know, to that just type of thing. something. Right. And so maybe maybe an article in the star every year about it, just to remind people, because one of the challenges that you have is when people don't pay attention to it all the time, they forget that they saw it. Mm. And we'll talk about that a little bit when we get into the idea of public education and public and citizen engagement. So forecasting and budgeting, which is the other side of life, which is this is the one where we try and guess what we're going to happen in the future, you know, provide a long-term financial picture of the city's revenues and expenditures, as well as ensuring annual budgets meet the requirements of the community. That's what we think what we're doing when we're budgeting. Uh, we do this to ensure that financial decisions are made with knowledge on the impact of the future ability to pay for services required and desired by the community. That's what we do. That's why we think we're doing it. So, you know, the questions that ra that this raises is how do we know if we meet the requirements of the community? Or, you know, obviously we come to the city council and we talk about it. 
and you're right, I've never heard anybody from the public come to me and say, oh my God, you're not doing it right. So maybe that's enough of an information, or do we go out and we survey people to see if they're thinking that we're doing what we want? Um, you know, how are desires of the community determined? You know, is it through just, you know, is it from, you know, obviously you guys, you get elected every four years. Is that how we find out what the community is determining? Is it when people come to the, come and ask for things? Um, you know, those are kinds of the other, or do we go out and we poll? Do we rate, ask questions of people? Um, well, that is how you quantify it, you know, because you might have one person or two people that are, you know, say the sky is falling and then, you know, everybody else is happy. Right. Or whatever, you know, and it's like, how do you quantify that? You know, it's like. Right. I mean, one of the things that we used to do in the past, we would survey, you know, we periodically we would survey, have a survey that we would send out to a random sample of the public. We used to, you know, we did that um, a while ago. We haven't done that for a while. It, that might be something mm -hmm. we want to do. Uh, I, you know, and it's always controversial when we send out a survey. Um, you know, it's, you know, but the story I always tell about is when I sent out the survey and we gave people money off of their water bill and they got money off their water bill and we told them the finance department is in charge of their water bill and we asked how often do you, how many people actually had contact with the finance department, we got 40% even though 100% of the people in town pay water bills. And we told them that was what we do, but they still don't understand that. I think, I think most of the time when you do a survey on something, people are looking for the reason why you're doing it, and it's the conspiracy theory that comes through. Um, if you ask how much do you value the pool, or are you call closing it, um, how much do you value um, whatever city service you're asking about, there is the, the thought that someone is going to try to take it from them. Okay. And if you're saying, would you rather have X or Y, people are going to answer the survey differently because they want to influence how that is, maybe not even how they think. Um, we've seen that with some of the things, the survey that is out there right now from a private ent entity. So, you know, I think that for most of our citizens, ignorance is bliss, and they rely on staff and the council to tell them if there's a reason why we need to talk about something. Okay, so, so that makes I sense. don't think actively going out and random surveys are really a good indication of the community. They, people, are involved to the amount that they really want to be in most aspects. Yeah. Well, I, I, know, I, I think surveys are, th they can serve a good purpose because a lot of people, as you can see, don't come to council meetings, <laughs> right? True. So it, it provides a way to, to connect with people on their own time. But of course, if you're uh, getting way too many surveys, then you get survey uh, overload. Um, but I think, uh, you know, periodically, I think it's important to, to ask general questions about uh, people's happiness in town and um, how we're doing as, as a city providing happiness service. Happiness surveys, that's a nice way to put it. Uh, well, uh, we, we've done that. We, 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 yeah, we've asked those kinds of questions. And maybe what it is is maybe once every five years, and maybe it's like if we pick a couple of topics that are of interest at that moment in time as opposed to a general survey of the, of the public might make more sense. Because, you know, if, you know, I understand that idea of trying to game the system to say, I don't want the pool closed, so therefore I'm going to rank the pool really high even compared to police. Whereas in reality, if you were to sit there and ask that question and say, you know, what are you more concerned about, exercising or having your car broken into, the, you know, people would probably be more concerned in, on a day-to-day -day basis about having their car broken into than the exercise that they get. And there's other ways to get exercise. So, I mean, it's, I understand, and it's trying to do that balancing act. Um, you know, and then just a, you know, for me, one of those interesting questions is: Should future needs of the community outweigh current needs and desires? And that gets to the question of you know, how much money do you put away for the future versus how much do you do for the public that that you're looking for today? Yeah. And and, and whose uh, future needs, right? In, in which community? I mean, <laughs> right. Yeah. So I mean, that's a question. So when we're talking about forecasting and budgeting, you know, those are the kinds. That's a question that I think, you know, for me. Is what's the purpose of why we're doing it, and what's the purpose of, 
you know, what's the purpose of saving money? We have a very – our policy is to put money aside, as Clark said. We have about $3.5 million put aside for a catastrophe. We have – Two and a half million put aside for a recession. We have another two and a half million in case the budget doesn't work out, plus or minus five percent in our revenues and expenditures, and that's how we've done it. And you know that's trying to at least get us through any big problem that we have. But should you know we have also decided that we're going to put money aside for a replacement of vehicles. We've put we're putting money aside to make, maintain our buildings. But when we do those kinds of decisions, we are making we're taking money out of today so that way decisions in the future are easier to make for the city council. City council has agreed with that in the past and just saying that, you know, are those the kinds of things that you want us to continue for us to bring forward to you when we're talking about the budget? And, you know, in the past it's been that way, and my guess is it's still that way. Yeah, you know, I mean, checking it's, a, it's in. a balance, right? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if you have revenues that exceed, you know, that, you know, what you need and that, and that safety net that is necessary, you know, building more of a reserve just to build a reserve and not and not address things that uh, would benefit the community based upon revenue that you're bringing in now. Uh, you know, I, I think that's something that you know you as a council we talk about. Right, and you know, and that's and staff tries to bring back the idea of balancing that, those kinds of desires as we do capital projects with what's the need for. Um, paying off our long-term liabilities. I mean, the city council, at the, when we talked about this last time, said that they want, if we are if we are better than anticipated in the budget for a year, you know, we'd want to put 80% towards future liabilities to reduce those costs so that way you're not making hard decisions in the future and putting 20% for capital projects. So that's, you know, something that the city council has said because it, you know, trying to deal with the PERS issue in the future may make future services harder to provide if we don't pay for it today. So, I mean, those are the kinds of balancing acts, and I think, you know, what, I, what I'm hearing is those are still the things you want us to be talking about and bringing back to the city council when we talk about how we budget and how we forecast our revenues and expenditures. Yeah. Um, moving through on to central service programs, you know, what we talk about in central services, administration again, city council commission support, citizen engagement, workforce development, the computer system, economic development, public education, stewardship of a public environment, stewardship of natural environment, and we'll get to a lot of those in other departments if we want to continue this process. But the two that I thought from city, this from central services that really have a citywide perspective are things like citizen engagement. So citizen engagement is proactively facilitate the communities, <coughs> and it's all the community, residents, businesses, and users of city services, ability to engage and participate in programs and services provided within the city and decisions made by the city council and boards and commissions. And we do this to ensure program services and decisions are reflective of and take into consideration the diverse people and interests who make up our community. That's what we think the purpose is of citizen engagement. I'm hoping that's what, we hope that's what council thinks it is. And, that's part of the question, and the kinds of the questions that it raises is, does proactively engaging with the public mean we reach out to the public in every way possible? So as we have new technologies, as we have new ways that people talk to each other, are we, is council expecting us to be part of every type of method out there? Or are we trying, or do we say that there are certain ways that we engage with the public and there are certain ways that the public engages with each other? You know, if you get to the point where, you know, we, if somebody sends us a, you know, if we have a Twitter account or we have an Instagram account, if somebody posts on something at 3 in the morning, are we expected to respond immediately or are we expected to take some time? You know, traditionally government has been, really likes to be deliberative in its response because when we provide a response, people take it as, and if, you know, as the right answer at that moment in time. And if you try and respond too quickly, you may not get that best answer possible. It may take some time. So the question, but in the public nowadays, if you don't respond immediately, they're thinking you're not listening to them. It's a challenge. As, as it's shown by our <laughs> presidential leadership and Twitter, immediate response is not usually a good thing. And that's good to know. In my opinion, yeah, yeah, but it, I think it just depends on on the situation, right? I mean, if there's a catastrophe, I mean, you need people need to know right away, right? Of course. As far as uh, the president, I totally agree with you, uh, Terry. Yeah, we uh, don't we don't want someone with their 
tweeting out responses at three in the morning. I don't. I. It's good to know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think um, I think society will tell us, you know, what forms of communication we need to to be doing. You know, that it, it keeps evolving, right? And, and, and that's the challenge. I I think we kind of I. I think we have been staying up with the times with yep. communication. I feel like we have, yeah. yeah. I think okay. that we communicate well, but there's always, always, always going to be somebody that says, well, nobody told me. It's like, you know, and I know I could, I could name 10 people on my hand right now who don't know what's going on in the city. They live here, and they don't really care until something big happens. And it's like, well, nobody told me. You know, they don't read the papers, they don't read the, uh, the internet or anything. You know what I mean? So you. And that gets to the next question. Right. That gets to the next question. What's the public's responsibility for knowing what's going on in the city? I mean, we have a lot of ways we put out information. At what point does it become the public's responsibility yeah. to understand what's going on? Open up the email or something or. or re know, re read your water bill. Read, yeah, read something. Yeah. I mean, and we agree. I mean, it's, I think from a staff perspective, this is something that we struggle with is, you know, what is it that council is expecting from us when it comes to this kind of interaction with the public? And what I'm hearing is deliberate, deliberate responses is okay. We're not expecting immediate, you know, response you know one of the things that i've really un be that i understand nowadays is a lot a lot of people what a lot of individuals will do what a lot of companies will do is put something out and then 20 minutes later correct it because they didn't have the right answer the first time mm -hmm. and they have to go correct it because they think being fast is better than being correct take whatever time you need to ensure that the answer you give is as accurate as possible okay i mean that's, then, that's my view. Yeah, you know, some of the old ways are good, you know, I mean, because, you know, like when the newspapers, you know, I mean, people got used to them for, you know, hundreds of years, right? And so in the 60s and 70s, and they had the Brisbane Bee, it was always written up from an objective reporter on what's going on with the city, right? And now we don't have that, right? We don't have, you know, we, we barely make, you know, the San Mateo Daily Journal, right, once in a while. That's right, and that's why we try and do the stars to try and yeah. provide that kind of information right. to everybody. But we send out the star, and then people say, "It's too Pollyannish. It's nothing but good things." Well, you know what he's supposed to write in it. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, more informative. You know, <laughs> I, I have a follow up to that. Yeah. So, so I did a a, a meeting with some people last month, and um, at, at my city council hours, and th somebody brought up, actually was. Thumping their their, their thumb uh, hands on the table, saying, "I've got a complaint." I'm like, "Well, I'm here to hear your complaint." Well, it wasn't a complaint; it was actually a suggestion, and it was a good suggestion. And that suggestion was implemented into the star. Thank you, <laughs> Chief Messias, um, and in Caroline, this month. So, less than a month later, there was a minor change made within the star that actually does look really good and has some information about what's going on in the community and I asked somebody what they wanted to see and they wanted to hear about all the murders and I said well we don't have any so <laughs> I guess people want a little bit more juice in the stuff. We can make up stories if they'd like. I mean, <laughs> talk about but the Texas. blog's good and Texas. you know people yeah. still love the Is that the one that came board. via email that we got? They were like I want uh, so some I, more newsworthy stories. Yeah. More newsworthy yeah. stories. I mean, so, so but I mean we can we can do that within the staff format. So. Yeah. Okay. I mean, and then the question is, what's the role that staff plays in citizen engagement versus the city council? I mean, city council is out there listening to the public, getting the, getting the information, and you know. And the question is, is how much should staff be out there talking to the public, or is that? I mean, to, you know, that's really a council perspective. Yeah. And other cities have it differently, where the staff is, you know, make, you know, going to all the Lions Clubs meeting, going to Rotary, and going to all those things. Whereas, you know, we don't have rotary, we don't, you know. Yeah. But, yeah. but that's, a, you know, it's, you know, it's one of those things is do we, you know, do you expect us to go to the mob or is that something more that the city council is interacting with and we're a small community and they, everybody knows you and that's what we've relied on in the past. Is that still what we want to rely on? Yeah. Well, it depends. You know, um, sometimes people want to talk to Clark. Sometimes people want to talk to Terry, you know, or, or Karen. I mean, it just depends. Right. You know, they feel more comfortable talking with their city council member about something. Um, but, uh, you know, having, 
Yeah, having those, you know, the, 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 and those clear lines of, uh, you know, communication that, you know, we re relay that information to staff. I think we have to be really careful, though, too, because, well, I think that that's what the mayor's column is for in the luminary, is to get out some of that type of information. But I think that it's hard for an individual to be the person to, to communicate to the public because there's a perspective that they're speaking on behalf of the rest of the council, which is sometimes not, ac which is mostly not accurate. And then I also think that like, we have to be really careful with social media, what gets posted. And, you know, I think from most perspective, like most on most occasions, it's better to just talk with a council member one-on-one -on -one, uh, via telephone or sometimes via email but I think to, you know, have any sort of, like, publications beyond, like, just the mayor's column, I think can get a little confusing. You know it will um, get used against you at some point. Yeah, and sometimes with the Brown Act, it's just not safe to post on social media or other places. I think it should just come from staff because <coughs> we as a council don't write up, a, like, a statement about from all of us. So I think that's what staff does. It's something that's on behalf of the city, which includes our position on things. And that gets us to the next topic, which is public education. Um, and so, you know, what's the question comes is, what's the difference between public education and public engagement? You know, my perspective is public education is one way. We're putting information out. Public engagement is two way, where people are giving us information <gasps> back. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is yes. like kind of that idea? Yeah. So is publishing, you know, is publishing information enough for public education? Um, you know, one of the things I talk about um, when I talk about putting information out is, you know, when we put something on the web on our website, we feel like you know we've met our duty of getting information out for, to the public. And what I, you know, one of the things I always think about is uh, I don't drink coffee. I'm not a mm -hmm. Starbucks drinker. But I know there's a lot of people who do drink Starbucks, and when was the last time those people who were interested, who drink Starbucks, goes on their website to see what's going on with Starbucks? So is you know, do we you know, as do we need to find more ways to get information out than some of the traditional ways that we've done it to really say that we're educating the public, or are we doing good a good enough job? As you said, you know, we're not getting a lot of complaints. Is that what we're is that meaning that we're getting enough information out to the public? <coughs> Well, you know they would complain if there was something they didn't like. I mean, people are not going to call you and say, way to go, Stuart, with uh, you know, the great finance report you put out. I'm but hoping. if you make a mistake in it, they're going to call you. I'm hoping they call you. Every if, week. If, if, they, if they see it. If they uh, see, and that's the question, <laughs> is making sure that people see, you know, are people seeing what we're putting out. To go, to go back one step about the should staff be out going to all the different meetings and meeting with all the groups and being proactive. Staffing is very expensive and our people are very well paid, but it costs a lot to have staff attend every kind of citizen group. And I don't think that's really an important thing for staff to be going to every social group or every activist okay. group and soliciting information. Most of those groups are organized as a body so that they have a voice and they can have a representative talk to, you know, they'll get one person to report out on that meeting and come to City Hall and say, oh, we need this or that or would like to see this or that. So I, I think that for me, as far as the budgeting and the cost of the city and the engagement, I think it should be more that either council does that as they feel the need, but I think that those groups need to know that there's an open communication way, you know, to let them know that if the mob or whoever ha Lions has an issue that they can come and interact with the city. Okay. Come I mean, City Hall, right, but not us going out and saying, hey, what's up with you guys? And, right. right. And, and, and I will say other cities have it the opposite way where they do want to have staff go out there. So it's good to oh, know no. that that's what you're, you as a counselor are looking Maybe for. Maybe big cities. Yeah, I think we're small mm -hmm. enough that, okay. you know, it, City Hall is kind of like a hub. 
Um, but you know, just looking at this education versus advocacy. Right. The last question is what you know. What, you know, that's always a question that. That's one of those things that we hear back is like it seems like you're advocating, you're not educating. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we have our our March twenty first um, home for all workshop, and I, I I saw something on social media. Granted, I I don't really look at it that often, but um, yeah, it was you know that we were pushing something rather than really want you to come to the workshop and and give us your your opinion of. What do you like about Brisbane? What are you know? What's your opinion about housing and other uh, items? Um, you know, yesterday I, I went before the seniors to try and promote the workshop because you know I think it's important that that seniors uh, get involved in in um, you know how how we plan uh, you know for the Baylands and um, yeah, there were some some folks that <laughs> weren't too happy because uh, you know they. It, they had voted a certain way, right? And others had voted the other way. And they're like, okay, give me some more information. But in the end, uh, <laughs> they, they were thankful that I did come there and give them that information. And, um, it, and I think kind of getting to your point, Terry, that, yeah, that really should be more of a council thing, you know, rather than, than, than staff. But, um, it, you know, I, I think it just depends on where you're, where you're, where you're coming from. I mean, we, we put out information about Measure JJ, and people thought that we were um, not putting out education, but we were promoting something. And that's kind of a, a fine line sometimes. Which is why I asked the question. It's like, you know, how do we, you know, how do we guard against that fine line? And, you know, and it, just because somebody says we're advocating doesn't mean we're advocate. Does it really mean we're advocating versus education? And what does that really mean? And you know, with uh, home for all, it's you know, is you know, that's one of that's another way to do citizen engagement. I mean, some cities do citizen engagement by having pop up events in little in neighborhoods, where they'll go and drive a van to a neighborhood and just say, okay, we're here. I mean, and that doesn't sound like that's really what we're looking for. You know, what the council's looking for us to to do That's yeah you know and you're right i mean i could see a city uh staff person going to a farmer's market and setting a a, a booth to encourage people to come to a citywide workshop on something right, right. and and um I, I guess we've done that. We've done that, but that's different. That's a different thing than you really trying to interact and get in, be engaged. It's really that's a public education process. Yeah, I mean, and that's and maybe and that's where it seems like you, know, you public education. It's okay for staff to do it. Public uh, civic engagement, public that two way is more what the city council is looking for. To, some, to a large extent, is what I'm hearing. And that's and as I said, this is kind of you know what I want to make sure is that when we're talking and when we're budgeting, we're budgeting towards the purposes that the city council wants us to budget towards. That's what priority based budgeting is all about. That we get the right priorities out there. And with that, I'm I'm done with everything for what I was looking at. Is there any other areas that you're thinking that, from a finance perspective, or that we should be doing differently? If not, I'll say. I think that was a very thorough report, Stuart. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Right so then we, the next. We question, love numbers. You love numbers. Thanks. So the next question is, you know, net, we were thinking that in April we would bring the Parks and Recreation Department to come in and do this, and we'd go through each of the departments this way. Is this useful or? I mean, the other thing I'm the other thing I heard tonight, to some extent, is we're doing a good job, and we're you know, and we're giving you enough information. Do you want to hear from all the other departments, or or is you know doing it through the budget process enough? I think it's. I mean, I think you guys are doing fine. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I I mean, I I would love to have Park and Rec come before us. Um, just <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah, going I think far. I think it would be great. You know, <laughs> here's the thing, Stuart. I mean, some people like numbers. You know, and, and some people are like, okay, you know, and I, I'm not real interested in that. But uh, everybody, and, and, and sorry, you know, I mean, I know that uh, it's, it's not a put down on you, but uh, you know, people love park and rec, though. I'm in charge of park and recreation too, so that, okay. I know. You don't want to do that for every department. I mean, I, personally, no, well, I, I think, feel like um, we've just validated most of like what you've already been doing. Right, and that's what I'm checking. Yeah, out. yeah, so no, so what I'm getting at is like, you know, Stuart um, talked about. Like, you know, every couple years, you know, every year, I mean, there's two departments, and they give a, a more in-depth 
uh, talk. And then the next year, you know, another department or two gives a more in-depth talk. Okay. So we'll, I mean, and we don't have to plan for April 4th for the Parks and Recreation. I mean, if we're, okay. we're going to do finance, we can say that, you know, maybe this year we can also do maybe Parks and Recreation in the fall. Yeah. Before we get to the budget, give you a break from If we from feel like this. we need it. If you feel like you need it. We'll let the mayor decide. Yes. Okay. 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 Thank you. Great. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Stuart. Any members of the public wish to comment on this? <laughs> All right. I'm assuming there's really no, I mean... There's really no, no actual discussion or action that needs to be done here. Uh, so I think we can move on to item B. Consider approval of the Mission Blue Sand Volleyball Court Use Policy and Amendment of the Master Fee Schedule Resolution. Staff report, please. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. All city facilities in Brisbane, including Mission Blue, Community Center, and picnic areas that we rent have general use policies. The purpose of these policies is to ensure the safety of facility patrons and to protect the city against issues stemming from improper use. In November, the Parks and Recreation Commission reviewed and voted to recommend that the city adopt the use policy and amend the master fee schedule. The attachments in your packet include the draft use guidelines, permit policy, fee schedule, and application. Staff conducted a fee study of similar facilities operated by other agencies. Based on that information, the Parks and Recreation Commission suggested a rate of $20 to $25 per hour for court reservations and $30 per hour for non-resident reservations. Imposing an hourly rental rate will generate additional revenue for the city. At this time, council is being asked to review the draft documents and proposed fees regarding public use of Mission Blue Sand Volleyball Courts and to amend the master fee schedule resolution accordingly. Happy to answer any questions you might have. I, I have a question that's not about the documents because I read them and they look fine to me. I'm just curious as to which colleges are interested in um, USF and Academy of Art. Thank you. How much use have the courts been getting? Um, not very much, just because of the season. So we've had some bad weather, and it's been fall, winter. Um, we are now st starting to see some use from USF because they're headed into their um, beach volleyball season. So, and we expect more over the summer and early fall. One more question. Is there is there any space up there for people to go watch people practice? I mean, for some people, that's exciting. There's <clears throat> there's room for spectators, but we don't have any, like, designated seating areas currently. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Noreen. Um, the folks that built it, this, this doesn't apply to them, does it? Well, so our use agreement with them is over the summer period. So in the months of June, July, and August, they are allocated 15 hours per week of use um, at no charge. And then anything beyond that would be a 50% discount of whatever the, the fee is stated in the master fee schedule. Okay. Thank you. And ha so have they, um, is it anticipated that they will exceed their use and pretty much block out most of the time for other other groups? I wouldn't say block out most of the time. Their intended use during the summer months will mostly be during the day, during the week. Um, I think we anticipate most of our public reservations would be on the weekends. So um, they, they, they were only able to use it last year towards the tail end of their season based on the completion of construction, but they were using it about 20 hours a week. So they would we assume that they would go over a little bit. Okay. And has there been any um, issues with the facility or maintenance that we have need to do or costs associated with it? Not at this point. Staff has just been checking it, um, auditing the facility on a regular basis, and really the extent of what they've done in terms of maintenance has been raking. Staff does that? Yes. I thought that was going to be done by... The people using it they the sf elite which is the volleyball club they're responsible for it during the summer months but not during the remainder of the year so when usf has been using it over the last couple of months when they can get out there despite the weather they've been raking it okay i thought you said city had been raking it when usf's not out there okay yeah thank you yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. So, um, Noreen, so the the non residential, non resident fee. So, is that would that be applied to the colleges? 
So, or is that, that is, I didn't, see, or is that a separate, that is? They would be a non-resident user group. Non, okay. That's correct. And then um, say a family in Brisbane, they grab their volleyball and they just show on up mm -hmm. to the site. They, they, they'd have to pay a fee. No, if, if it's not being reserved, then it's open to the public on a first come, first serve basis. First come, first Similar to how we um, use our picnic areas. <coughs> Okay, so it's only if you want to reserve the court. That's correct. Okay, so if someone has made a reservation and they show up and there's people there and say, hey, you know what, we have a reservation, you're going to have to leave, then that would be the case. Yes. Okay, all right. Thank you. No other questions? I have none. <clears throat> Anyone from the public wish to speak on this item? No. Okay, council discussion. I make a motion to approve uh, the court use policy and amendment of the master fee schedule for regards to the Mission Blue Sand Volleyball Court. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, we're right towards the end of our meeting here. Moving on to staff reports. City managers report on upcoming activities. We've got um, a couple, not too many this week. So um, again, our um, Home for All event will be on March 21st at the Mission Blue Center. Um, it'll be beginning at 6 o'clock, uh, going to 8.30. Dinner will be served, and we will be having a child care available at Brisbane Elementary for ages 5 up. Uh, the other items of interest, um, the LunaFest Festival, again, will be on March 23rd. Short films by, for, and about women. Are, all are welcome. Uh, you can sign up um, on our website at the City of Brisbane. Um, Brisbane Village ha Helping Hands will be having their St. Patrick's Social on uh, this Saturday from 3 to 5 with Barbershop Quartet at the Sunrise Room on Visitation. Um, free native drought and tolerant or free native and drought tolerant landscape design class will be on March 27th here at City Hall in this um, I believe in this room um, from uh, 5:30 until 8 p.m. Um, the sign up for the spring break camp with Parks and Rec session one will be April 1 through 5. Session two will be April 8 through 12. And also the Brisbane Summer Camp, uh, June 24th through August 16th, is officially open for registration. You can do that on our website or come in City Hall. Um, and the Brisbane Night at the Giants game is on Friday, April 20th, uh, 12th versus Colorado. Uh, tickets will go on sale March 12th at 9 a.m. in the Parks and Rec office and are $18 a, a piece, um, a ticket, I should say. And... Uh, just a reminder that um, if you want to stay up to date on what's happening in the city, our weekly news blast goes out each Friday, and you can sign up for that on uh, the city's website. Um, also, just a couple other items that aren't on the list here, just to um, give you um, a little idea of what will be coming up or what we're working on is um, trying to get uh, Recology in to do a, an update for you on their um, project and what they want to try to do out at their site. That's changed quite a bit over the years and uh, just wanted to get the, the council and the community kind of up to speed on where that was at. Um, I'm trying to get that scheduled. Um, it's kind of alluded to in Stuart's presentation, but we will be doing uh, the capital improvement program um, and looking at our uh, liability funds um, in probably June. That will be embedded in an actual uh, council uh, meeting. Um, and then uh, next Friday, uh, Councilwoman Cunningham and myself will be attending a meeting by Senator Gen Jerry Hill on the CASA issue. Uh, so we'll be definitely reporting back to you um, in April uh, with regards to that. And then um, also the San Francisco um, Airport's um, development plan, they will be coming to uh, the council meeting on April 4th to give you a presentation on the SFO uh, development plan um, project. Can I add one thing to LunaFest? Um, doors open at 5.30 for VIPs and 6 o'clock for uh, general admission. The show will start at 6.30. Tickets are about 50% sold out. So if you're interested in going, 
We highly recommend getting your tickets now. Do not wait to the last minute because we are anticipating we may not have any available at the door. Um, and that's it to add on to that. Anyone else have? Well, I guess we would move on to Mayor Council Matters. So that brings us to our next item, countywide assignments, subcommittee reports. Anyone have any reports? I can go first if you want. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> well, Mayor and I had a Luna Fest subcommittee meeting, and we were with Park and Rec representatives and Stewart. We think the planning is going very well, and uh, she is, the mayor has done a fabulous job of fundraising for the Lions Club scholarship program that it'll be benefiting. Thanks. And then um, I attended a local policymakers group, which is High Speed Rail and Caltrain, for their business plan and project going forward with electrification. High Speed Rail did make a presentation um, to us and wants to assure that uh, that we know that they are still participating in the electrification project and their which they call a book a bookend uh, project for High Speed Rail, and they are confident they will still be able to do a rail project in the state and expect to have a plan for where their preferred route will go for high-speed rail um, to us in about a year. Did you have anything, Karen? Well, we, we had a public uh, meeting, but we heard all about right. that tonight. Yeah. So. I had a Peninsula Queen Energy meeting. Um, there was like quite a robust conversation about this new effort that PC is funding, basically it's $750,000 spread across three years to implement a program um, to encourage people to test drive um, electric vehicles. And basically they're looking for each city to kind of host one of these sorts of electric vehicle test driving events in partnership with a nonprofit. And for example, like each test drive is equivalent to a certain amount that is donated to that nonprofit at the end of the event. So for example, if the Lions Club can get, you know, 50 people to test drive a car and it could be equivalent to like $5,000 or something. <laughs> so um, there was kind of a debate, a really robust debate amongst the group feeling like this was not the right way to promote people using electric vehicles and or buying electric vehicles. They felt that spending this money um, is really doing a, the dealer's job for them. It's like essentially marketing for the dealers and making the dealers money and there should be other things that we're doing and how do you tr like effectively track how many c electric vehicles ended up on the road because of these sorts of test driving programs that were funded. So at the end it was adopted, it was approved, but there was this feeling amongst the group that they were kind of you know, frustrated that this is what came out of this, like that that was the result. So anyway, I may be bringing forward to you guys, you know, a, a, an idea of how we can incorporate this test driving and, you know, putting PC in contact with a um, nonprofit that this might align with. So anyway, uh, and that's, I think that's all I had. Uh, let's see. Um, I didn't have any subcommittee meetings, but uh, I did attend the commute.org um, event at um, the Phase 3 Genesis building in South City. Um, I guess that was on, I guess it was on Tuesday. 
anyways, um, you know, I had a, a, a conversation. This guy's, his name is Tony. I forgot his last name. He's the person from Caltrans that's been working with San Mateo County in regards to the express lane. And we had a good conversation about um, trying to get uh, Caltrans, um, uh, you know, um, information, that, you know, in regards to how they were going to deal with sea level rise along the 101. Um, and he said that they would, um, he would reach out to me with a, a, a person that could provide information um, to staff. Uh, in regarding that, because as we know, a lot of people in town are concerned about sea level rise as it relates to um, the Baylands development. And so, um, and yeah, so hopefully uh, he'll pass along that information or that contact. And then, um, you know, CCAG and uh, Home for All will be hosting a joint meeting about CASA <coughs> on um, March 15th. Um, if I get the details, I'll pass them along. And I know that uh, Council of Cities is having a meeting on the 14th uh, to choose two members um, within the county, two council members, uh, to serve on a, um, I guess, a committee to, um, to deal with CASA as well. Have we sorted that out yet, our representation? Yeah, uh, Karen's going to go. Is, is that what you're, Jerry Hills PD? No, 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 no. No, the city select. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as of now, Karen and Cliff can't make it, right? And we were asking Terry or Clark if they're able to attend that. It's at 4 o'clock. On what day? Um, 14th. March 14th. And I'm filling in for Cliff on CCAG that evening. Um, that wouldn't conflict with the 4 p.m., but I have an appointment right before that that does. And I'm being interviewed she, by them. Yeah, and Karen's applying, right, for one of the positions, so she can't vote. For the CASA. No. Be back. Okay. So can she I not? Suppose. I I think I did uh, contact the clerk for the committee, and he said that you may be, you will be able to vote if you want to be the proxy. Oh. So if she's already going to be there. Can she just be the proxy then? Yeah. Because that way we don't have to. You're send. okay with it. But we. Oh. But then, then if if I can vote, that's I'm going to be there. So. But you probably can't vote for yourself on. Why not? Pad. Yes, which would we if we want? Yeah. Yeah, I, I need a I need a vote from Brisbane, for right. me to sit on. The BPAC, which. I don't. I don't know if th that's the CCAG um, mm -hmm. position. Yeah, I, I the um, I, I, that's. I think that's a different body that that would appoint you to that um, position. But is that vote occurring? Yes. At that meeting, so we would need somebody other than Karen. Karen can vote on the city selection portion, but Karen can vote for herself. Well, I, I think that that special meeting that's in. Can we find the, out? It's, it's it separate. Right uh, now. Yeah, I think I think they're separate. I, I've got. Well, we are speculating, and the the thing with this emergency city selection meeting is that they do don't have a list of candidates for the position because it wasn't noticed. Tomorrow's early the enough. deadline to submit your letter of interest. So it's going to be nominations from the floor, and it could be that council wants to give direction to whomever is going to be attending that um, what our take is and what direction what person we want to be on that committee and I'm not sure how we would be able to make that decision well, that's we don't know who's being. Well, that's assuming no one has sum submitted like a letter of intent by tomorrow. I I'm sure that they, there, they, there will. They be are. They are so confused. They lost my initial application that I submitted in December. But th th that's a different. That's a separate one. She, a separate uh, she's one. talking about this uh, council cities oh, um, meeting. This, this <coughs> special <coughs> emergency meeting to put someone on about. The CASA. 
That is correct. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we should just leave it up to the person who is going to make the vote, and because we don't know who those people are. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess we could, I mean, we'll know by the, the end of the day tomorrow. I thought they were also going to be accepting nominations from the floor, though. But we may have a list of people then, and I'm just wondering how, because if I need to, I can make that meeting if that's not the meeting you're talking about. So um, they're, they're, they're separate. I'm I, I know that they are separate. <laughs> one's one CCAG, the other one is the Council of Cities. Okay. So and she might not be at that meeting. She might be at another meeting. So, I mean, if I need to be at that meeting, I can, but I would like direction on, who? Um, on, on what type of representative, because I know that there was an issue with between Gina Pappen and Alicia Aguirre for who, who was MTC. going to, to yeah. be on because of their um, who, their differing views on CASA. Yeah, yeah. One, one voted for CASA, and, and apparently that was one of the issues uh, that right. uh, uh, didn't uh, garner support for her uh, reappointment. Correct. Well, do we have any people off the top of our heads right now that we would say, you know, we would nominate this person from the floor or if they submitted a letter of intent. And Terry, I, I would say use your best judgment if you're going to go. <laughs> I, I, well, you, you, yeah. And, but I'm not um, sure I know enough about the, who? who and what their politics are. So I think that who I would knows? like direction or help from staff and council on the names on who may because we haven't gotten a good enough update on CASA and all the ramifications as a body to really know Coming from MTC, who would... consider it bad. Well, yeah, yeah, well <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm serious. No, right, no. yeah. I mean, uh, you know, based upon the, the, um, the, the, the meeting that Clay and I attended down in um, Mountain View, the presentation given by the, the CASA folks. If there's anyone who wants to be on that committee that's, that's in support of it, don't, <laughs> don't choose them. Yeah, they're going to have to give them right? it, right? I yeah. mean, you got to be, yeah, I mean, someone who, who feels that the local land use authority should stay with the cities, that, that, that those should be your, your folks that you <coughs> go with. So can I ask that once we get the people, the potential, the nomination letters or the letters, the applications, mm -hmm. that staff coordinate that and let this body know however is reasonable to do it without br violating the Brown Act so that if anyone has a concern, they can weigh in to staff and give some direction. Is, is that clear? I think so. <laughs> I mean, no, I, you know, I, okay. I, I know what you guys <laughs> Okay. It'll be clear Ask from the attorney, their right? <laughs> it may be no, clear from the resumes. On, yeah, it'll yeah. be clear. Right? I mean, I, I think I can make some phone calls and make sure that, you know. We're on the all on the same page. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you who I'm not voting for. And well, we know who either. that is. So, anyway, let's move on. <sighs> City Council meeting schedules. The next City Council meeting of March 21st is canceled in lieu of the Home for All workshop, which is very important for everyone to go to. And the next Council meeting is scheduled for April 4th. Written communications. So we have written correspondence from the following members of the public. Christine Oquendo on February 21st. Amended budget for the school study. Bill Detmer on March 4th, Baylands Cleanup, and Ray Miller on the 5th, specifics on civility policy. So do we need to vote to give me proxy? Yes, I need to fill out a just a paperwork. Form. Okay. A form just needs to be filled out. Okay. But that's if Karen's not going to be at that meeting, right? I believe it's a, it's a different meeting because it's only specifically for Okay, we'll work it out, and then I'll sign the, I'll sign the paperwork. Okay. Uh, okay, that brings us to oral communications number two. If there's anyone from the public who would like to speak at this time, seeing no hands, okay. Do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.